Good afternoon. Welcome to Inside Indiana Sports Now with Kent Sterling. It's Tuesday, July 20th, 2021. We're brought to you by the great people at Today's Dentistry, Dr. Mike O'Neill, the best dentist that there is, the only dentist I've gone to the last 28 years. You know why? Because he's the best dentist that there is. Call him, make an appointment, do it right now. 317-849-2933. Punch subscribe, hit like, ring the bell, let's go, let's talk about sports. I want to talk about the Indiana Pacers today because tonight is game six of the NBA Finals. I think the Bucs are going to win tonight. They're going to win their first NBA championship since 1971. Small market teams don't win a lot of NBA championships unless LeBron James is on them. The Bucs threatening to do that tonight. And the question is, how close are the Indiana Pacers to getting to the NBA Finals and contending for an NBA championship. If the Bucs get this done, the canard that small market teams can't do it is going to be shattered. So let's look at the Pacers. Let's look at the two teams in the NBA Finals and try to gauge exactly where the Pacers fall as far as and what they're lacking in their attempt to try to become championship relevant in the NBA. The Bucs, here's their starting lineup. They've got Brooke Lopez at center, Giannis Antetokounmpo at the power forward, P.J. Tucker at small forward, kind of, although he, a lot of this, like there are no more traditional, or not a lot of traditional centers, power forwards, small forwards, uh, shooting guards, and then point guards, but for the the purposes of this exercise, we're going to go ahead and assign those positions to people. Anyway, uh, Chris Middleton as a shooting guard, and uh, Drew Holiday as a point guard. Dante DiVincenzo, terrific ball player for Villanova, came out and and played exceptionally well with the Bucs as a starter, got hurt right at the end uh, of the season, hasn't been able to participate. Uh, But we're not going to overlook Dante DiVincenzo. All right, so those are the guys. Giannis, obviously the best player with the Milwaukee Bucks and probably the best player in the NBA right now. So what you need to win an NBA championship, you've got to have the best player or somebody close to the best player. And then you've got to have a good wingman and a number two or three scoring option. All right. For the Suns, you've got Chris Paul at the point, Devin Booker. You've got Bridges at the three, Crowder at the four, and Aiton at the five. So who do the Suns have that you really worry about as being a top 10 guy in the NBA? Devin Booker, he's close. Chris Paul is a Hall of Famer, I think, but he's toward the end of his career. So the Suns are really, uh, among these two teams, you would look at the Bucs starting lineup and then the Suns starting lineup, and you would say the Bucs are probably the favorites because at the top, they've got the better player, right? Giannis Antetokounmpo, best player in the series. Usually series are won by teams with the best player on it. Let's look at the Pacers. Pacers with Miles Turner at the five, Domas Sabonis at the four, although they're a little bit interchangeable. Domas plays a little bit more five, traditional five in the offense and in kind of a a four matchup uh, on defense. But anyway, you've got Miles, then Domas. You've got TJ Warren. You've got at at the two, Karis LeVert and Malcolm Brogdon at the point. So how far is that starting lineup away from the starting lineups of the other two? Not so far with the Suns. Kind of a long way from the Bucks because they don't have somebody like Giannis Antetokounmpo. You don't have that great guy. Can you get him at 13? Maybe, but it's going to take a while for him to kind of ferment a little bit and become as robust and flavorful a basketball player and as dynamic as he's going to be, assuming that the Pacers take the best player available at 13 and don't reach for somebody and crap out. If you do that at 13, you got problems that are going to be long lasting with your franchise. You've got to be able to cash in at this level of the draft. You've got to go, hey, Devin Booker was a 13, right? Donovan Mitchell was a 13. Uh, Zach Levine was a 13. We say it almost every day. We can recite these people from memory. Kobe Bryant was a 13. Tyler Harrow was a 13, not in the league of Kobe Bryant, obviously. Here's where the rubber kind of meets the road in comparing these teams during the 2020-2021 season. The Indiana Pacers starters, 
lost 147 games to injury or illness. For the Bucs, they lost 35 games. Giannis had, uh, lost 11. Drew Holiday lost 13. The Suns, they only lost 22 starts to injury or illness. Their roster was really, really healthy, and that is something that the Pacers weren't. I mean, and you can do the math. 147 games lost among the starters. There were 72 games played. That is better than two starters. On average, you are down each and every game. T.J. Warren only played four, so he accounted for one of the starters for 68 of those games, over 90% of those games. But Levert and slash Oladipo, out for 28 games. Brogdon missed 16 games. Domas missed 10. And Miles Turner missed 25. If you have that level of injury and illness, and you've got a first-time coach that was in over his head, Nate Bjorkren, you got problems. Pacers have all these guys coming back. They're, at least they're all under contract, and they're all scheduled to come back as it stands right now. Plus, it, you've got the two holidays. You've got Batadza. You've, you've got kind of a, a pretty dynamic second group. If you re-sign McConnell, that's a guy that you're going to have. And if you, if you retain somehow or another Dougie McBuckets, he's a guy who can knock down shots. And he compares favorably to a guy like Pat Connaughton, who fills that role for the Bucs. So where the Pacers are missing, they missed in terms of health this past year in, in a huge way. And then they also miss not having that top-line guy, that guy who is going to be an MVP candidate. And, and the Pacers have really not had that guy for a long time. They had Reggie Miller back in the day, who, who was capable of playing really well, not an MVP uh, quality, right? Jermaine O'Neal was a legit MVP candidate in 2003-2004. And you look at Paul George, not an MVP candidate, but as the best player on the team, not bad. Good two-way player. Top 25 player, maybe just barely top 25 at that point. Probably just barely top 20 at this point. So the Pacers with the 13th overall pick, can you find somebody who can develop into what Giannis Antetokounmpo has become? I think you've got about a 1 in 15 chance of getting that guy. Those guys are really, really hard to find. And they're especially hard to find at 13, 14, 15. Giannis, uh, an anomaly, he was the 15th overall pick. So that's kind of where the Pacers are. Can they trade their way into it? Generally, you don't. Generally, you're trading for equivalent parts, right? Free agency, it's not going to happen with free agency because free agents aren't going to leave their current team. They're going to be, you know, unless it's LeBron, right? And LeBron didn't come into central Indiana. Uh, God bless Central Indiana. I absolutely love living here. LeBron, I don't think, has any interest in living in Central Indiana. He left his home of Northeast Ohio to move to L.A. I think he's staying in L.A. So are the Pacers close? At four of five spots, their lineup compares okay. They're all right. You know what? The Bucks this past year, 46 and 26. And what does that convert to in an 82-game season? Right about 53 wins. I think that the Pacers this upcoming year, as long as they don't blow this thing up somehow or another, I think they're capable of winning 53 games. For the Suns, their record was 51-21. and 21. So that's really more like 57-58 wins. That's tough. But the Pacers are going to have a coach, the likes of which they haven't had in a while. And that's Rick Carlisle. Rick Carlisle, as a head coach for the Pacers in 2003-2004, set the all-time mark for regular season wins at 61. I want to talk about Aaron Rodgers for a minute. How smart is Aaron Rodgers? He's absolutely owned the offseason, the NFL offseason. Every single sports center on ESPN has a story about Aaron Rodgers. Is he going to be back with the Packers? Right? People, that, that's going to be the big story of training camps as they open next week. Is Aaron Rodgers going to report? We went through this with his predecessor, Brett Favre, while Aaron Rodgers was a backup quarterback with the Packers. We remember Chris Mortensen down at some bizarre airport in like Kiln, Mississippi. 
you know, on Brett Favre, watch, is he flying to Green Bay? Is he going to Green Bay? It was never ending. Aaron Rodgers went to school at the feet or at the knee of Brett Favre, not just in terms of how to be a professional quarterback and how to really succeed at, at a high level as the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, but he learned a lot about manipulation of the media. And, and Aaron Rodgers is manipulating the living hell out of the media at a level that is absolutely MVP worthy. Is it not? Aaron Rodgers getting it done. Everybody's talking about Aaron Rodgers. Why? Like, either he's going to play for the Packers or he's not going to play for the Packers. What in the world? Why are we so invested in what this guy's going to do? It's just fascinating to me. Uh, I can't wait to see what happens. And that I, I'm ashamed of, frankly. It's the soap opera aspect of the NFL that I try to stay away from. But this Aaron Rodgers thing is kind of interesting. And and so, you know what? We watch, we wait, we learn, we listen. We wait for Adam Schefter to tell us what what the world Aaron Rodgers is going to do. What's wrong with us? The Olympics, it was said by uh, the head of the committee in Tokyo that it could be a victim of a last-second cancellation. The Summer Olympics... If the Summer Olympics are canceled, this is a complete debacle for everybody involved, for the media involved, NBC, instead of having a a ratings galvanizer for all its NBC affiliates and one that is worthy of, you know, huge financial investment, it's not going to have that. The city of Tokyo has invested heavily in the infrastructure needed to create an Olympic village. Right? Stadia and, and aqua parks and all of that stuff. If that goes unused, that's a complete waste of, of how much in terms of construction and, and how much money. This would be an absolute debacle. They can't do it in 2022. It would just be gone. This Olympics would vanish into thin air because of fear over spread of COVID. And COVID is a different thing in Japan than it is in the United States. It is uh, advancing, it is spreading, and it doesn't look like the Japanese are able in any real way to control it. So it may be canceled. Opening ceremonies are less than 72 hours away and the Olympics could be canceled. I'm not really jacked for the Olympics anyway, but that's not the point. The point is, it isn't what am I going to watch on TV, you know, during a period of time where you really don't have a lot going on, right? The Cubs suck, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time watching Cubs baseball. Preseason football gets cranked up in about four weeks, right? Uh, the NBA Finals, I think, are going to end tonight, but certainly they're going to end by the end of the week. And and so what do we have to watch? We have the Olympics to watch, but I'll find something else. I wasn't going to watch a lot of it anyway because it's not live. It's in the Eastern Hemisphere, not the Western Hemisphere. And so we've got to watch whatever is on, either on a delayed basis or we got to wake up way early to, to be able to watch. And the, the Olympics aren't important enough for me to be inconvenienced by them. So... It'll be what it'll be, and if they cancel it, they cancel it. I would be stunned if they did because so much money is at stake. And as we've learned over the years, always follow the money. The NCAA, what are they going to do? Mark Emmert's talking about how it might be time for the NCAA, as we know it, to sort of dissolve as an oversight association, right? As an umbrella to uh, kind of hold college athletics together. Maybe it's time for the conferences to take over. And maybe it's time for the conferences to find a coalition among them, the Big Ten, the ACC, the SEC, the Pac-12, the Big 12, in all likelihood, and put together kind of a group where you're doing college sports differently. What we've learned over the last couple of years, at least, is that amateurism is finally being accepted as the sham that it's always been, and that it's become the NCAA, a toothless oversight organization where nobody's penalized for nothing, right? You know, it takes years and years for the process of penalizing a team for blatant cheating to be exhausted and, and to come to some kind of end result. And, and so if you're not going to, if you're not going to, if they're not going to levy a consequence, a meaningful consequence against you for your bad act, what's the disincentive for the bad act? 
right? That's where the NCAA is today. Tomorrow morning, Breakfast with Kent. Cannot wait to talk to you tomorrow morning, bright and early, 8 o'clock.